All right. Hello, everybody. Um, tonight we have a special guest, uh, Jeff Byers. Um, he has been around the hobby um, for a very, very, very long time. Um, to the new people or people just who possibly live underneath the rock, this man has worked for Mike Wilbanks. As you can see, he has a shirt on. Uh, Mike Wilbanks, uh, he has worked for Bob Clark. Uh, the Lizards. Um, he has done everything he has seen everything just about uh he has been part of pretty much all the when it comes especially when it comes to retix pretty much like every groundbreaking project that's got us to where we are today this man has known about it been some some you know been been part of it some some kind of way um so anyhow uh tonight like i said we have jeff byers chip go for it bud well uh, as everybody tells it jeff uh i will elaborate a little bit um and uh you can start going into your history but uh jeff started out way back in the day uh with mike uh wilbanks and a lot of people don't know now especially nowadays that mike was into retix and uh had a lot of the beginnings of that where i'd like to start and move in with that is just how you got into snakes and how you ended up working for mike and bob and how your experience learning about the biggest snakes on earth uh well like i remember i remember as a like not even a teenager like i i have a tfh book of snakes like that one we all had when we were kids and there's just gigantic normal retic coiled up like on a heating pad in a zoo or something. And it has these like bloody orange red eyes and just the regular wild pattern like albino didn't exist back then. And those eyes like that entranced me into retics when I was little and like they were really cool. But they get so big. So I was never able to talk my parents into having a retic. I was like, oh, well, they typically only get like 15 or 16 feet long. It's not a big deal. And like, it's a big deal. And I was like, I was working at a pet store here called Alligator Alley when I was, I had a work permit from my middle school at age 13 through 16 to work at this pet store. And so uh, I worked for credit. Um, I, I got on credit, $200 of credit, a Parsons Chameleon way back in the day. That tells you how long ago that was. They're like three or four grand now if you can find one. So uh, dating myself a little bit. Uh, and, you know, Brian didn't have too many retics at any given point in time. He, you know, he's, he loved them and appreciated them too. But, you know, we're selling pets to people. So it's kind of a liability in certain regards you got to and he was very cautious about you know not putting himself or the store in jeopardy so we didn't ever have that many retakes but when we did i would mess with them i would move wild caught little i say little you know six or eight foot retics and like dodge bites and you know mess with them berms you know other anytime he got big things uh went on to uh work at ten title lizards after that um, at the time, one of the largest collections of geckos in the United States and probably the world, like this is in, you know, uh, 95 or six, I want to say. He was primarily day geckos though, wasn't he? A lot of Felsuma, yeah. Uh, right now, they're doing mostly uh, fat tail geckos with some e extra emphasis on like Australian terrestrial stuff and <laughs> like a little more obscure species that have become available in the last few years. I still help them out. I haven't lately, but uh, I'll help out Larry uh, Boyle from time to time, do some extra stuff, get caught up on babies or sometimes him, he and Tim will schedule vacation like the same weekend by accident or something. And, you know, I'll go help out with uh, geckos. It's, it's been maybe a year since I've done that, but you know, still it's like riding a bike. Um, so after Tim title lizards was like, uh, I think normal human job after that, I was a dispatcher for a cable company for a while. So fast forward after that, 
I was actually working for Mike part time during that. Um, people would laugh now. He had like a hundred ball pythons, maybe, and then maybe a hundred. No, he didn't have a hundred big retics. He had about two dozen adult retics and various babies or yearlings at any given point in time. And I would only go there one day a week um, to take care of retics. Uh, he had hired another guy, David, uh, that was full time. And I was training David on how to take care of retics, how to not get killed by retics. And I had only the experience of owning like three retics myself at the time. So like I was, we were kind of learning together <laughs> on a lot of things. Um, I got a dirty Sanchez from a head albino retic one time. That was not cool. Just due to like, and I, okay, gotta wash my face. I'll be right back. It was, it was not pleasant. Um, got a couple bites during that. We learn, we pull eggs, we decipher babies and, you know, grow experience there. Uh, more retics. Um, see and then i worked at the pawn shop but not with the snakes it there's a weird like i love them to death there's a weird saga of me and mike for the last like 17 years ish give or take um so i would help at the pawn shop or i i worked i was employed by joe's pawn shop that and anybody knows him like the shop the reptiles were in the back of a pawn shop for a while they're no longer there you know hey okay, great um but then every now and then we weren't busy in the pawn and they'd have me help dave and cody in the back it, it was strange so then um uh, i got fired from the pawn shop so i couldn't work in the snake shop anymore either weird how that works and then i went to work for bob for Hold on. What? So while you were, let, before we go into that timeline, let's stop while you're first real working with Mike part-time slash pawn shop when Mike had a bunch of retics and you first were there with him. Okay. What, did, what did Mike have that nobody else had? Um, I don't think at, at that time period, there wasn't anything that no one else had. We had, uh, we, he had, uh, gotten Baldogo's, uh, original, uh, wild caught Jampias and the couple captive red ones that Al had and a nice big super tiger. Uh, I don't know if it was a first clutch super tiger it was one of the earlier super tiger girls. Um, we had a pair of tigers had, uh, Type 2 or AML, whatever you want to call them. Uh, Bob always called them Type 2, so that's like ingrained in me that they're Type 2. Um, oh, sorry. Um, and we had dwarf head albinos. We had albinos. He, he had two of the original very first clutch albinos. Three. Um that Bob had produced and then he, Bob had sold those to rare earth. Mike went and got a couple of them. I don't know if directly from rare earth, but roundabout way he wound up with, with three of those original albinos, uh, purple and a lavender and a big white one. Um, I can I, are you, are you hinting at something that I am forgetting? Okay. No, well, well there's that, anything... that and the super dwarf stuff. Uh, well, I mean, they had they had gotten in a bunch of the original, well, not the very, they had the very first Super Dwarfs. Mike had a few of them there. Then we got another batch of Super Dwarf, but, you know, these were actually labeled. These were Madu or Kiawati or Kalatoa or whatever, uh, but we had the previous Super Dwarf ones already that wound up, I guess, being hit Annery later on down the line, or visual Annery even. Yeah, we had Annery Super Dwarfs, like, and didn't even know it. James, what do you want to say? Oh, and Jason wouldn't tell us. He was just going to let us keep making them. 
I remember that. And he, he finally like felt bad and fessed up to me one time. Like, Hey, like I wasn't going to tell you, but like you guys have been making Annery super dwarfs for God knows fucking how long. And like, Oh, I, I, I remember that conversation. <laughs> yeah. No, I was just tripping on the fact that y'all were getting, uh, SD stuff and they were labeled. The first ones weren't. This, there was another batch that arrived. I got to go pick ticks off of all those. That was fun. Uh, and they got they were labeled. I mean, because I know. I mean, at that, I I had bought. I had I don't know how many fucking pairs of SDs from Bob, mm-hmm. and that's just you know SDs. So right. Yeah. Those the there was a time period where they came in with identification like at least the island that they said they were from right right you know we got to take them at face value right and then yeah. later there were madu and kalatoa and right some of the other ones that we now you know know more about or a little more about all so, right so so those were the animals that you got to see pretty early on and i say that not many people had because in all honesty back then not many people had them. You could probably count how many people had those type of animals. Right. Or at least in that, you know, nobody had 30, except maybe Bob and Mike. Right. We had um, several racks of them in quarantine while I was picking ticks off of them. And, you know, we were making sure they were cool enough. So um, was the pie there before you went to Bob's? No, no. Um that was uh that was a deal he that i that was a deal like he was working on at the time that i left or got left you know whatever you want to call it um and it was a trade the guy's name is mills i can't remember like the whole the whole to do but they there was a trade with the original fire ball pythons that mike produced here in the u.s so the first ones that were in the u.s and there was a negotiation made, and and then you know that was for the Piedra tick later, and so it was some Mike or Bob had sent me to go pick up something from Mike or drop something off. I don't know. So I was convenient because I knew where everything was, and so Bob sent me over there. And uh, <clears throat> you know, Mike and I were cool. I, I didn't you know part ways with the pawn shop because of Mike at all. You know, he he tried to talk to his dad about letting me stay, but just uh, wasn't going to fly. So I um, went back and did whatever errand the other was doing for the other one. And that's when I saw the Piedra tick and <clears throat> Mike, Mike was, I guess, trying to get me bit or at least scared or something. I don't know, but I didn't, uh, I didn't falter. I, I held strong. So he said, hey, like, take a look at the fiber tick. And there it is over there in the cage. I was like, oh, hey, cool. Like, that's awesome. You know, it's nice to see him in person. And, oh, hey, like, we need to move him anyway. Do you want to put him over there with that female, whatever kind of fucking retick that is? I was like, yeah, sure. So I slide the, the glass open. And, you know, I've, I've handled a few wilder ticks at this time. I know he's going to be wiry. And I picked him up and I treadmill him like we do as professionals. And I got to the other cage and I put him in and shut the cage and he's like oh well that was no fun like <laughs> the pied apparently didn't really care for mike a whole lot and would keep trying to bite him like and i worked with the original pied male quite a bit and he wasn't super bitey he was very flighty he did not want to sit still ever but i mean if you walked into a bite i'm sure he would try but he wasn't like i've, I've handled way way more aggressive uh, for ticks than the original pie. He was just flighty. He did, did not sit still once you had him out. Yeah, Bob, I just saw Bob's video not that long ago how he publicly announced that the pie finally died. Yeah, I saw it too. But, uh, okay, so we're back up. So you're leaving the pine shop and how did you get a job at Bob's? Uh, well, now, I since they weren't having me help with the snakes it was it was very rare that they had me help with the snakes while i was employed at the pawn shop 
So I said, hey, like, I'm off every Wednesday. Do you care if I, you know, go work for Bob part time? I said, yeah, I don't care. So I went to Bob and said, hey, you know, you need the help. And he, you know, Bob always needed help. So um, I went over there and was like, hey, you know, I've got every Wednesday off. I can come help out and do this or that, whatever. And it's like, yeah, sure. Come on by every Wednesday and we'll, you know, find you stuff to do. Okay. So it was it was a one or two day a week thing. Whenever I, sorry, whenever I wound up with like another day off, I'd call him or, you know, it, it got to the point of where he said, Hey, just, you know, if you're off, come by and you can clean stuff. And, um, so the, when I got fired, I, I went directly to Bob's like that day or the next morning or something. I was like, Hey, um, I kind of am unemployed, so like I could use a full time job if you can handle a full time guy. And uh, like, yeah, sure, just don't call me old because that's how I got sideways with Mike's dad. Because I, he was joking, and I was joking back, and he didn't receive it well. And you know, Joe's a great man; it's wonderful. But we just we butted heads on numerous occasions and personality clashes and such. So yeah, it's whatever. Um. So began working full time at Bob's and um, one of his uh, employees at the time had been there a couple years. Um, and I don't I don't know Bob's justification. I don't know. You know I, I was I think the other guy, Abe, uh, was upset that I was being paid like the same as him, I think. And I had just started but you know you guys know like if you go into a job with 10 years of experience should you get paid like uh, as a guy that's starting first day no yeah, you should yeah. get paid like you have 10 years of experience and i was paid because i had some experience and bob could point me to an aisle and say hey like clean all the pet stripes on this aisle and that's what i would do and it was joking, but my manager at the time, he came over one day. This is a month or two in. It's like, hey, man, like, you got to slow down a little bit. You're making this look bad. Like, I'm, I'm not slowing down. <laughs> I want to get done. <laughs> because, you know, retics are allergic to clean. Like, do you put down fresh paper or fresh bedding or mulch? They're going to wreck it and shit oh. all over it. There was one... Uh, I hated this snake like super hard. I'll admit it. Uh, this tiger head albino that Bob had this thing. I cleaned this cage four times in one day and I was about to lose my shit because she had literally had ass explosion all over the six foot Neo three times. And I was like about to pull my fucking hair. I wanted it clean for like an hour and she wasn't having it. And I, Kept, and, and she wasn't that friendly either. So I had to interact with the snake way more than I should have for it to be clean for like an hour. And it just was not having it. And I was like, Rance actually came and got me. He's like, Hey, like you, you need to go switch to, you know, go to the, go to the boa room or go, you know, <laughs> he, he knew I was like at wit's end with this snake. So he, he, he finished the cage and, you know, I, I went to go clean baby retics in another room much more manageable than a 15 foot irritated head albino tiger. So anyway, lot of, lot of retic, berm, Salinese, Indian, Python, whatever you want to call it. You know, when I, when I first started uh, working for Bob, he still had a few uh, Salinese pythons, you know, Pimbura was absorbed into yeah. uh, Molaris. So they didn't technically exist anymore, but there was, some documents or something because they you were, could tell uh, the difference by looking at them though. Yeah, yeah for sure i i totally agree with that and the the salinese were surly <laughs> uh, but, and indians you know, relatively pleasant but not salinese whatever doesn't matter um yeah we had he had timor pythons ring pythons Cuban boas, uh, Cuban boas, baby Cuban boas are friggin' huge. They have like three or four babies, but they're gigantic. Um, yeah, we had jungle carpets. We had uh, Stimson's, Maclots, Spotted Pythons, all kinds of stuff. Like 
everywhere. Um, yeah, I mean, just it was it was an experience for sure. Uh, learning about the Bob knows a ton of stuff. Like at reptile shows, if people talk to him, like they're just scratching the surface. I mean, he he's got a very broad range of things that he's knowledgeable about. So well, that's what people yeah. people don't get. They like they talk to you. Uh, and they hear your stories or they see Bob post or they hear about Bob Clark and they just think, okay, retech snake breeder. A lot of people don't realize that Bob is a legitimate herpetologist. Right. It's, and it's, it's, he, he doesn't go into that field because it doesn't make the money that breeding snakes does. Right. But he has the degree and he has that knowledge. Right. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, it, it's it's insane to to think about like some of the just a fraction of the education that man has. Um, so I, I learned, you know, there's a comedian that has a, a Ben Bailey has a bit about being an accidental ornithologist. Like I never went there like trying to learn about uh, birds of prey, but I mean I, I learned a fair bit just peripherally from Bob and. Uh, you know, ask questions. He'd be out of town, so I go to the house and and feed a hawk and an owl or whatever. Um, you know, he uh, he had friends that would show up. Like on two separate occasions, two different people showed up with golden eagles at the shop. So that was badass. Uh, Chase Dellis was one of them, and uh, his local friend Oscar Pack was another that brought friggin' golden eagles to the shop. It was amazing. Wow. Yeah, Chase drove all the way down from Minneapolis. To bring yeah. a golden eagle to the shop, like that wasn't the exclusive reason, but he he traveled with a friggin' eagle, <laughs> <laughs> like in one rolls roll with eagle, you know. <laughs> um, I don't remember why Chase came down actually, but you know, met a ton of amazing people: Rich Eiley, Monty Crees, and Carl Herman. Met all those guys through Bob. Uh, Rich Rich is a wonderful man. Um, Monty is crazy, but awesome. Rest his soul. And Carl was the biggest sweetheart and also humble as shit. Never took credit for anything. You know, like, I know he was, but, like, if I didn't know who Carl was, like, he wouldn't have seemed like a snake guy. Just by right. just judging him. Just for right. well, exteriorly he's, judging him. That's he's right. an insurance salesman by trade. Yeah. <laughs> Slash guy that started tiger retics, you know, no big whoop. And captive breeding green anaconda. Yeah. Yeah. Basically pioneered that shiz. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Jack Hanna, you know, I know he doesn't sit in popular favor with everybody, but like, it was still cool to meet the dude. Yeah. Um, uh, Carrie King from Slayer came down to the shop. Uh, I talked to Hank the Third for about 30 minutes about his next snake purchase because Bob was out of the office one morning. Uh, figured I could handle it. Yeah, did okay. Um, Hank's a weird guy. Did he? Did he buy something? I don't remember. He was he was going on tour and he didn't want to get something and then like not be around, so he wanted to wait. I don't know if he ever did. But, I mean, I talked to him, so it was cool. Um, tons of falconers. Uh, like, Bob, like everybody knew, all the falconers knew where Bob was. So I, I met a good six or eight local-ish falconers. Uh, you know, uh, Chris Kimball is just out uh, west of OKC a ways. Uh, met uh, him and his now wife. You know, they were super cool people. Um, you know... Let's see. Oscar's son, Monty, worked at the shop part time too. Uh, so got to hear a lot of interesting fireman stories. The odd thing was like firemen uh, and snakes. So uh, Mike Kane was EMT. Uh, Rance went to be a fireman. Monty was a fireman. And then Webb Tilton, a good friend of Mike and Bob's at the time, uh, is a fireman. Like, Something about firemen and snakes. Like, I don't know what the correlation is. It's saving now, or something. I don't know. <laughs> you didn't start going over to Bob's shop till after Pegleg worked there, did you? Pegleg? Chris. 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 
Pirate. Oh, Brown. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, that was after. Uh, I think I saw Chris with leg before, like earlier, like when I was like a brand new baby at Bob's and like they came to visit. Uh, Cody, he was with Cody Elkins was a, I only remember it because the guy had like his name emblazoned on the side of his truck and Chris had brought Cody Elkins up there to the shop with uh, some attractive young women uh, to go look at snakes and stuff. So I remember this is now etched in my brain forever. Uh, that's the first time I met Chris Brown. Uh, I don't know. I don't recall. I, I don't know when he, he had his injury or whatever. I don't know. But I seem to think that was not the case at the time. But whatever. Uh, now he's a Buffalo. So it's a now he's a Buffalo salesperson. Yes. <laughs> um, God, so many people. Uh, Michael Hicks and Tim Hickok were good friends of Bob's. Uh, they were there with some regularity. Um, lot, an, an interesting arsenal of, of people uh, know Bob uh, and would frequent the shop at any point in time for anything. Well, no offense. Uh, this isn't a Bob Clark episode. This is uh, Jeff Byers and his experience with snakes. I spent, I spent seven years there. So, I mean, like, it was kind of a big deal. All of it was instrumental. Um, but, yeah. So, what's your next You're, question then, sir? What, how, how, were, how was it getting thrown in from seeing Mike snakes and then having to go over to Bob and clean up literal 20-foot snake shit all day? Um, Dealing with the fluffies. All the different ranges of fluffy. It was it was humbling because like there were, you know, Mike Mike only had a couple, two or three retics that were that big. The rest were like moderate, more manageable sized. But Bob had a lot of big ones. Like all the original head albinos, most of them were pretty beefy. Um, there was one that no one. Uh, no one saw, I think she got shipped out or something. I can't remember what happened to that one, but like I was eating my lunch was like a sandwich on a trash can. And I'm like sitting there on, a, not a trash can, but like the snake barrel that like we would contain them in between. Okay. So I'm sitting there eating my sandwich and like, I hear this like earth shattering kaboom and the snake has popped the glass out of a six foot Neo and it's like laying on the floor. Somehow the glass didn't shatter and she just like flexed to the snake was as big around as a volleyball. And she just decided she didn't want the glass in there anymore. And she flexed and popped the glass out of the cage. Glass was uninjured. And I just picked it up and she's still sitting in the cage. This, this is seconds after I heard all the crash bang and put the glass back in. I was like, okay, that's fucking terrifying that you can just do that whenever you feel like it. And your head's bigger than my hand. It's a big snake. Um, yeah, uh, black dragons, wild ones getting loose at the shop, clawing out of the top of Neotiches. I had to go do some ninja shiz to go catch one, and I don't know how it didn't run outside, but it didn't. And it clawed through this is in the new building, it clawed through the top of a Neo, ran into Bob's office. Bob sees all of this, is like, and he sees me corner this four foot wild black dragon in the corner. He says, all right, so what are you going to do now? And I just like <laughs> mustered all my ass and moved the fastest I've ever moved in my life. And I like, ninja grabbed this thing on the shoulders, like right the perfect spot, like, you know, one inch up and you get bit one inch back, you get bit, but like grabbed it in the perfect spot. He's like, yeah, okay. Well, that works. <laughs> that sounds exactly some shit that Bob would say. I remember going and he used to <laughs> love playing that, that, uh, He'd get a he'd get a feisty retick and and play a uh, hide your or watch your crotch, watch your crotch, <laughs> sit there and hold it by the tail and and and, and let it swing and try to bite you in the dick. God it damn. was the weirdest thing. He he had some some machismo that they can sense. Uh, more than once, I handed like uh you know when he takes the photos outside of like a teenage you know year or two year old retic to, that you know he's decided gonna let go of for whatever reason i would go he'd say hey go grab a 
whatever snake. I go get it. And if it was nice, it's nice. And if it's not, I'd tell him like, Hey, like it's like trying to kill me or whatever. And I hand him, I remember one specifically was a double head albino stripe. And if you remember James, those were saucy. Yeah. They didn't like humans at all. And I handed him this snake that was trying to take my face off 30 seconds earlier. And it just like sits there for him. I was like, it's fucking bullshit. Sick <laughs> So, yeah. What else, Chip? Since we can't talk about just Bob. Well, there's so well we're trying to learn about your experience. Yeah, the history. Those are, those are my experiences. We're but like I, mid seven about... years of stuff like working for Bob and shows <clears throat> and all these different Memorable clutches, memorable snakes. Um, one of the most memorable for me was the very first motley sunfire tiger head albino retic because it was a very small clutch we had like so few chances to hit this and we needed a male and it was from a boob egg and the clutch had gotten like a little bit dry so we're pouring water back in this uh container of eggs you know we we cut doors in the tops of the eggs we poured water in the eggs to rehydrate them i like we babied these snakes this like and then i i could see which one was the one we needed i was like holy shit that's it that's the sunfire motley tiger holy balls and um you know babied this snake i checked on the snake every day to get him going he was the very first one on the planet you know, he, he was very important. And like I said, he's from a boob egg. So he's like 15 inches long. He's like a husky carpet python at this point as a baby, you know, he's a little bitty guy. And I, I babied him and hand fed him and checked on him twice a day and the whole deal just to get him going. Um, you know, the albino pieds, they were crazy because of the, having the whole retic crew there. And then like, we cut half of that clutch with them there. And the other half is what uh, had the albino pides in it. Or I don't, I don't know. I don't remember how that all played. I was crazy to think like the next morning, Bob was like, Hey, um, did you, did you look in those ever again? I was like, mm, no. And he's like, oh, is that one of pides? I was like, Holy shit. And then like, we kept them under wraps for a while. That until was hilarious. Well, um, that was the best best time on Retech Nation I've seen in many years when Bob pops out of nowhere. Well, I I told him to like we were literally packing for a show and we were like he had keys in hand and like hey Jeff we need to go to Arlington. I was like and I said no you have to say something you have to do it right now before the show or else it's like going to go all to shit while we're gone and we're not going to be able to to recover from it and backpedal or, you know, whatever we would have needed to do. And, you know, so we stayed at the shop like a little while longer and he told the guy, uh, you know, Matthew Hearn was keeping the snakes for uh, Paul Angelides, I think. And um, then he said, Oh, I remember hatching my first pides. <laughs> like, Ooh, that's going to sting. All right, cool. That's that's Arlington. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then you guys were uh, – Bob went dormant after that, and then Matthew kept running his mouth, and then Mike, who never talks about retics, pops up and just goes off on them. Well, the only reason he did – I talked to him about it later, and I, I was actually in the van when they were talking to this guy trying to organize – some aspect of this sale because um, he had Mike had sold Paul like the the first pair of tiger head albinos or head albino double head albino pides like that he had and because uh, Mike had hatched a one egg clutch from a white uh, albino and then a very small uh, I think like ten egg clutch maybe or less from a small purple female so there's this very small group of purples and literally one uh white face uh het white so uh, 
Angelides got that pair and you know, he, he was busting Mike's balls like the whole time about not thinking he, that's what he got. You know, he went sideways with him so many times. The guy was just a really difficult person to deal with was my understanding. I never personally spoke to him, but I, I heard secondhand information that he was um, less than pleasant to deal with, I'll say, to not get anybody unwarranted emails at this stage years and years and years later please don't email people <laughs> but yeah i mean matthew seemed all right you know i i believe he was just taking care of paul snakes is my understanding i don't know matthew we're actually facebook friends but that doesn't necessarily mean we talk on a regular basis like i have i have no dog in the fight whatsoever i don't care but yeah so there's that with albino pieds and then like the figuring out of like the het white and the het purple, the lavender male, like what's, what's the frigging odds of the very first one being the lavender? You know, you had a wild het white and a wild het purple that happened to be in like the same square mile radius from the jungles in free in Thailand. They managed to hook up and then the little fucking thing survives long enough to get caught by whomever caught it and got it to the right people that got it to the right people that got it to Bob. Eventually it's astronomical to think about how all that had to play out to get where it is. And, and I'm a very left brain analytical. I think about all those little stupid details that, that nobody really thinks about like the mechanics of that working out in the universe is like insane. I don't really think so. I think of it a scientific way because the way genetics work, I mean, every genetics got to start somewhere and look at all these random recessives that come up and play and they're caught in the wild. A recessive is a recessive. Yeah, I, I grant it. That's a double recessive combining and making a lavender, but right. it's still, it's still the same concept of two genes that just split basically. Yeah, but it's like finding a wild highway ball python. That's possible. Sure, it is possible. It's ridiculous to think of it, but it is technically possible. You're absolutely right. Yeah, to have a fucking gravel and a yellow belly mate. Yeah. But anyway, I uh, can find it. <laughs> um, that, from my understanding, and you you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but that the original. Anson obviously got it for or sent it to Bob. That's right. Yeah, it did come from Anson at one point. But, but uh, I, I was under the understanding that Anson actually got that animal from Malaysia. I don't know where. I, I, I know that Anson was the final sale point to Bob. That's I, Where it originated previously, no idea. Anyway, but uh, favorite snake, a favorite retic you've ever worked with or had? Hmm. Well, I mean, I spent so much time with Bob's retic, so I mean, it's got to be one of his. I I grew a fondness for, um, and it, and it's for doing the things that we tell people not to do. Uh, we had a super tiger sunfire fire, and a dwarf annery. Fire. The dwarf annery fire was my favorite one, and and I, I really have a special place for the uh, motley sunfire tiger het purple. I think it's, I think that's what he wound up being was het purple. Uh, that snake, you know, I always puppy dogged around the shop. Uh, you know, there were males like you knew you had to like kind of watch yourself with, but like the albino pides, for example, they were super tame. And like, we mess with them all the time. We moved them from girl to girl. Like they were, they were some of the few that I could take out, like throw, literally throw over my shoulder, go walk around to the next het for that male and put him with that girl or whatever. And like, not have to worry about them. The albino pides are really cool. I like them a lot. And this, uh, this sunfire fire super tiger, it, it knew me. Like I, I, you know, basically cut it out of the egg, raised it up. Ever, like I was in the snake's entire life and I could open the cage and there's a fine line between balls and stupidity. I know I could open the cage, 
stick my hand in, and we all know retics are really in tune with their environment and warm things entering the environment. I could put my hand out to this snake. He would rush me as if to grab a rat and would dead stop right next to my hand, smell me, and then retract, and you could see him become at ease, and you just pick him up. This wasn't a big snake. I wouldn't do this with a big snake. He was like seven, eight feet long, you know, because a male doesn't have to be super big to do his job. So we didn't get any of them like really big. Some of them just got big, but you know, not excessively big. I can literally do that with a couple of the wild cots I have here. And they'll stop? Yep. Okay. Well, you got more balls than me then because I wouldn't do it with a wild one. Save my fucking life. <laughs> I th- these these couple wild cots in particular are some of the most amazing retics I've ever been around in my life. They're so smart and they're some of the sweetest snakes. Then you have well, never mind. Let's not talk about that one. But <sighs> <laughs> so those are, those are your top retics. Yeah. So. Do you own any retics right now, Jeff? No, I do not. Why is that? Because they, um, I don't, I don't want to say I got burned out on them. I do love them as a species. I love retics. They're great. They, uh, keep you on your toes. I actually enjoy that. I don't like running head first into like, you know, something like really horrible, like a really terrible specimen, but you know, uh, they're a lot of work. They make a big mess. And I presently don't really have the space that I want to dedicate to, you know, a six foot cage, an eight foot cage, you know, where I, I, I see the trend in herpetoculture now, like we're, we're giving these animals a lot more space than we have in the past. And that's great. Um, I just, I don't have a, a place where I want to put an eight foot cage right now. And, you know, I can do more personally with that space with wall pythons or carpet pythons, which I do have, or, you know, have a retic. And if I had a retic, it would be a pet. That's um, good. My screen just left for whatever reason. Well, we can still see you and hear you. It, okay. One retic, let's say right now, 2021, you were going to buy a retic one as a pet. What would it be? Uh, I like the Jaguars. Um, that That's the one that, you know, every, you guys, well, not everyone, you guys, I know, remember the old Jaguar that Nerd had a long time ago, that big female. And Kara told me back when they were together, I actually went and stayed a weekend at many, many, many moons ago in New Hampshire. And uh, I asked about the Jaguar, and that's when they told me about it. But he said whenever they tried to pair her, like, she would start just wrecking her face. And, like, she was to, – to save the animal, you know, they'd pull the mail and, and quit trying. And, you know, and it, obviously he tried on more than one occasion. And every time they put a mail in, she just would go bonkers and start wrecking her face. And I think they just quit trying to breed her after a while, I would imagine, uh, just because she just wasn't having it. Uh, I'm glad to see that that's worked out of like the current Jaguars. I don't know. Do you guys think that the nerd line Jag now and Bob's Jag line now is the same as that old one? Yes. You do think so? Yeah. hundred percent. Okay. I mean, that's fair. I don't know. I, I think they're very similar, maybe same. Uh, I think they're compatible. You know, it's, it's not like, the banana and coral glow shit there. I think it's the exact same animal. Right. I mean, just like the overseas, they call them Harlequin or Harlequins oh. is what Fila calls them. And he imported that one from the same general area. Yeah. And there's been a ton of wild caught ones since nerd and Bob have had theirs. There's been a lot. But anytime they're imported from a European, they call them Harlequins. Hmm. They don't call them Jags over there. And since we can't pull import anymore here, right. everything that comes out of that region, it becomes a Harlequin. Hmm. So, 
So it's probably a regional genetic that's floating around there, it seems. Probably. Yeah, I don't know where Bob's originated. Uh, Mike and Bob got that snake uh, from a guy from Czechoslovakia is all I ever heard. And they brought it back after a ham show in Germany. And we just called it the Czech. And <laughs> it was from a guy from Czechoslovakia. And I asked him, like, hey, like, who was that? Like, I wish that name would have stuck. <laughs> That's cool. That that was when the Jaguar being called the check. Hell yeah. yeah. Well, I don't, I don't know that we even thought it was similar and, you know, Bob thought it was a genetic stripe and, you know, we had a lot of stripe stuff and, you know, and this, this male was uh, seven feet, eight feet. He wasn't big. Um, so, I mean, he it resembled a stripe in some ways, but I mean, it had, it was obviously different in some ways too. Um, so I'm, I'm glad we finally got to breed it and, you know, he got babies out of it and that it proved out after all that. What, what I think is cool. What a lot of people won't know is because there's so many retic people now that are ignorant about history and ignorant where these animals come from and really don't care about where these animals come from, which is sad. Right. But you, whether you were there when they were imported or you were working there, you know, the original stripe was there. The original albino was still there. You know, the original. What? I was there when he sourced the male uh, stripe. He found a male. There was a guy in England, I think, had one. And, you know, he had only had the female and had made heads. Uh, and then the heads were like about ready to breed, but then he was able to get the male. And so I actually got to work with both of the original stripes, the wild caught stripes that we then paired together later and, and produced the, the genetic stripes. And it's pretty those, awesome. those animals, when, when, when they're lit up, amazing. Are just some of the most um, exactly amazing looking animals, just beautiful. I was actually talking with somebody about the striped pythons in general, even some striped boas. Like, it seems odd to me that, like, there's people like us. I know we all love genetic stripes, the three of us. And I know there's a lot of other people do, too. Some people, like, some people don't really like G-stripes because they, they like the original, the wild-type net-like pattern of the retic. And, you know, it, it does take some stuff away, but it shows us – what else that pattern can be, right. you know, something like, and we know the wild type. We love the wild type. We love albinos and motleys and, you know, a partridge in a pear tree, but stripes too. Stripes are great, but some people have like a near hatred of striped snakes. Like, you know, I was talking to somebody, this was about genetic stripe ball pythons, but I referenced stripe or ticks too, that just some people love them. I, I love stripey things and I love the regular wild type things too. I prefer right. horn snakes are absolutely amazing. I mean, when yeah. it comes to tigers, I prefer I prefer a classic pattern mm -hmm. or a striped tiger. But right. When it comes to literally the the a genetic stripe, that's that's just a, that's an amazing animal, and it's it, it's yeah that the you know, right. metal gray blue on the sides, the the cream stripe separating everything, and like it's discernibly obviously way different than a super tiger. So you got a different stripey effect there, but yeah, the, and the eyes, you, you can't hardly duplicate those eyes, uh, except maybe like a Bally. That would be the closest comparable and, thing. In and mind. that's why I think, you know, I know that there's so many speculations on yeah. where that G, G stripe came from, but right. with that original, with that bright yellow head and those eyes, it had to have come off that Island. That it, it's, Okay, I'll first say for the for your future audience, there was no locality data ever with either genetic stripe ever. Yeah. With our knowledge, the combined knowledge that the three of us have, it's probably a bally. It's probably a Slayer, one of those like localities. Do we know? No. But, I mean, education says most likely. And those were popular places to go harvest wild retics at the time. So, you know, that's logic. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, back in the day, I mean, I don't, I don't remember 
how big into retics when we've talked you were, but like back in the nineties, everybody was getting the Sumatran types or Thailand or wherever. And so those retics, those wild cuts that were coming in, it was cool. But the minute, the yellow head showed up. It was like a game changer. Everybody oh, yeah. wanted a yellow headed retic. Definitely. The, the, the wild caught the, that time period that you're talking about, those valleys that came in around that time period. Amazing. Yeah. It, it, it just, you know, was something different than what you're used to seeing yeah. at that time. So that's what made it, you know, everybody wanted one. Right. And that's, and that's why a tiger was special and, and is special. I, I love tiger retics. They're great. Uh, because, you know, they showed us that, you know, not all retics are chainsaws. You can captive breed them. They can be really great animals. Uh, you know, you, you have to understand this animal's basic instincts as to how it functions. But once you understand how a retic is going to respond to everything, like, they're not that bad. You just have to read your snake. Pay attention. If it doesn't want to be jacked with, don't jack with it. It will let you know. <laughs> that tiger retic story though is hilarious when i talked to carl about it nobody really knew carl that's around now but like i had to ask him about that and how he really didn't care he truly just it was his pet it was bob that convinced him of everything right. and monty and it was just he happened to be the guy that got a very unique retic didn't care he didn't even name it Right. And, you know, it was just his pet and it turned into all of this and basically started Baldago's business and Dave and Tracy and everything else off of this one animal that Carl did not find it a big deal. Right. <laughs> Tiger right. paved the way for retics as you know them now. Yeah, a lot of people just it's almost like they don't they don't have any clue. Now it's all about a white snake. Friggin' Tyree, man. Fucking, fucking Tyree. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> Shit. I don't even yeah. know. Him, but I know his hatred of tiger retics. <laughs> it's just ridiculous. I mean, it, it, it was such a groundbreaking thing when that came out. And the only thing that overshadowed Tiger was when Bob debuted the albinos in, in 2000. Yeah. Yep. I, I saw those animals. Um, he had gotten sideways with the promoter of that. Uh, show and so he wasn't there for a number of years and then he was there the year that he made the albino retics and I saw them I saw those original what six seven about yeah, I think it was seven yeah albino retics on his table that he later sold to rare earth or whatever deal they struck I don't know I wasn't there at the time but I saw them at bought like he had one table, two tables, a relatively small display, all things considered. Um, and I don't remember anything else that was on the table other than those glowing baby retics. And the white phase, holy crap, it's so bright when they're like, they've had like 10 meals and like they, they're just starting to fill out a little bit, but they're still babies. Like they look amazing. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that's underrated. What do you think? Out of everything that you've seen, been a part of, what's 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 a retic that you think doesn't get enough love? G stripe, G stripe, they're, they're amazing. Yeah, and uh, you know, we made a blonde genetic stripe. That thing was nuts. I'm sure he's made a few more since then. It was a you know. I remember that. I remember trying to buy that. But man. That's a cool snake. The, when we saw the first albino stripes, those were great. Um, I, I know that people have done more with like Sunfire and and Platinum being fire put into it uh, <laughs> and, and all that since then. But like, it's hard to beat just the regular G stripe, in, in my opinion. If and that's why I think that's why I like the Jaguar too is, is it's got a lot of that same striking coloration it's it's arranged differently no yellow head and i don't remember the eyes i don't i don't go look at retics every day but um I, I think it's the striking difference of those why they stand out to me um you, you know what's really sad though now with everybody that's in the retics everybody just wants to make 
animals or inbreed animals just to try and be the next Facebook king. Right. You don't see animals like when they first came out anymore. Nobody cares. They're just trying to put stuff together. Right. And they don't care about the consequences. So all that wild caught bloodline is gone. Like all the prettiness. I mean, I you go find a D stripe right now that besides maybe mine and one other person that I know that looks anywhere close to the original. Yeah, there's probably not many. We coming to get you. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, um, uh, so you work for Bob. You spent a lot of years with him. Uh, there's, I know we're coming up on an hour here, but I did want to touch on this. If you don't want to talk about it, that's okay. For all the old school people that are going to see this, they already know about it. Mm -hmm. But you were right there at the forefront when Bob had his massive fire. Yeah. Are you allowed to talk about some of your experiences during that? I think so. Um, like it, there was, there was no, I don't think there was any secrecy involved around the fire. It was, it was wow. horrific. Can, can you explain like what happened and what you did and what you guys might've lost and what you were able to save? Um, I have I had photos of buckets of baby retics. Mo it was mostly retics. There were some ball pythons and boas and things, um, but the epicenter was in the main room. Uh, there was an electrical short somewhere. Never really determined where, um, but basically in the center of the room, and uh, sometime in the middle of the night. The or, or wee hours of the morning, there was a call uh, from the alarm company, and you know we had it, it was it was kind of a janky alarm system. So like there were sensors tripped at all hours, not not very often, but like enough that like they were usually bullshit. Well, like I, I did roll out there a few times, like you know, in the middle of the night trying to figure out like what it was, if there were, there would be a, a snake may have accidentally gotten out that tripped a sensor or went in front of a motion detector or whatever. So like, you know, I, I passed it off as a false alarm. And then Susan uh, called me. That's uh, Bob's late uh, ex-wife or former, not ex, former. Not ex-wife, his late wife that passed away. Late wife. Yeah. Who knows how to word these things? God rest her soul. But um, she called me frantic uh, and told me what was going on. And I said, hey, I've got my daughter. I'm not sure what to do. She said, bring her. I will watch her. Just Bob needs help. Bob needs help. And so I, I put on my work clothes that had come off only a few hours ago and, and went back up there and, you know, talked to him for a second, tried to assess what was going on and just like start going in and grabbing snakes. Like I would go in and find, uh, <clears throat> I didn't think this would be hard to talk about, but it kind of is. <laughs> we go in and find a snake, you know, cruising around on the floor, you know, big 12, 15, 16, 18 foot retic. And like, they knew, they knew we were helping. Uh, pick them up, drag them down to the the far end of the building. <clears throat> huh. I didn't know this was going to be hard. <laughs> it was it was a very emotional day. I cried a lot that day. Um, just tons tons of animals that I took care of, and uh, it was bad. It was hard. <clears throat> Damn it, Chip. <laughs> Well, I think people, the reason I brought it up is people take these large collections and want to make them, you know, huge. And they think they can be the next Bob Clark. And they don't know how much responsibility and care 
for the animals and stuff like this has happened. Bob isn't the only one that this has happened to. No. And yeah. it's devastating when you work with these animals and you have a loss like that, whether they're your animals or not. If you're a caretaker of these animals, you really do care about them. And that was my point of bringing this up for and sure. the tragedy of it. And that's what's getting lost, really. This is, I mean, as bad as it sounds, I'm glad you we could see how you felt on camera because these people are taking these animals for granted. They're buying the largest snakes on earth for Facebook views and trying to make the world first and sticking them in whatever. And they're not thinking about the animals at all. And you put blood, sweat, and tears for a lot of years in animals that weren't even yours. And when tragedy like this happens or something happens, it, it's, it's incomprehensible. And it's, it was one of the most horrific things I've ever seen. You know, people want to talk about, when that fire happened, it was, it really kind of pissed me off because you would get on the forums at the time. This is before all the Facebook groups really. And you would be like, you would hear people asking other people, Oh, what did Bob lose? What genetics were lost? What projects were lost? All this. They didn't care about the animals. They wanted to know if the projects were lost or if stuff was going to happen or if Bob was going to sell all his animals. I saw so much horrific shit on a really bad tragedy. I'm, I'm thankful I didn't see any of that. I didn't pay attention to any of that shit. So that, that would have, that would have been very bad. Yeah. You know, um, no, there, there was no like singular project loss. You know, obviously like that was right after the very first pides had hatched. We lost a couple of those, um, still had a couple of the original clutch, um, eggs that were in the incubator was, was one of the more painful things because the, the older eggs that had been incubating a while, um, they were fine. And they, I mean, they were in the same room that, you know, the fire was in and they were okay. But the newest eggs, like, egg, you know, we'd, we'd pulled a lot of eggs lately right then. So any of the new clutches that were, probably like in less than two weeks old, like, you know, those, those expired. Um, the, <laughs> I, I found in the aftermath of the fire, like we, we took snakes and just put them in cages. Like as, as what, like after, uh, after the fires obviously put out and, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's not under control. It's not back to normal, but it's not a fire anymore. And, you know, we're, we're cleaning up, we're trying to, and, and thankfully it was in the summertime and it was warm. So we didn't have to worry about it being too cold for the snakes, which was a good thing. Uh, but, you know, the, you know, Bob's trying to, you know, he had a show in Japan that he was obligated to go to. So he went to that show while we were still, uh, cleaning stuff up at the shop. So we're just trying to make heads or tails of things. And uh, one, we only had two male um, double head blonde stripes. Funny, we just talked about this. Uh, and one, uh, they were in a stack of vision cages uh, in that same room uh, over in the corner by the sink. And the, the males were in the top two cages. The, uh, the first one, in the top cage, he had succumbed to the effects of the fire. And the other one had, uh, the glass had shattered in the cage. You know, the, the, the top one melted to a puddle. And the second one had escaped somewhere. And we just took, like, every teenage, you know, six or eight or nine foot retic we could find. Like, they went in a three foot or they went in a four foot or whatever, whatever cage we could reasonably put them in. I went through to see which ones I could recognize and I recognized the assholery of <laughs> their dad, the remaining single 
a double head blonde stripe. And that's how we were able to make the blonde stripe girl in the new building was, and we knew which girls, you know, were the double heads, but the males were in this other place. So, you know, remembering that specific snake was key to uh, being able to do that. And it was only because uh, I had accidentally put him with his brother, whom didn't remember that he was his brother, and attacked him and left a big slash on the side of his body, healed up. You know, retics are friggin' tough, you know, except for fire. Um, and that he had that scar. I found that scar on that snake. I was like, holy shit, this is that snake. This is the male double hat blonde stripe. Holy shit. And so that was something that was not necessarily lost, but it would have been a major setback to get Stripe back into Blonde, make a double head again, raise up a male for a year or so until he's ready. And then, you know, that project would have been put on hold a couple of years at least just to do that. So that was one thing. Um, yeah, I, I, nothing, nothing else was like lost, no project like crippled or, you know, anything, but I mean, it was, it was a big loss for Bob. Like, it, like it's, it's hard to even think about like each room, uh, of, of snakes that was uh, in that, that, cause you know, there was the tortoise room behind his desk. You guys have both been to the old shop. Yeah, yeah. So there was the tortoise room back there. There was stuff back there that was affected by the desk, behind the desk, all through the main room in the secondary room where Fluffy's cage was, stuff in there. And after that room, like the the fire didn't go into anywhere else. You know, it was it's like half a mini mall for the people that haven't hadn't ever been there. And so like the drop ceiling, it was connected through the ceiling. So there was just smoke and soot in all the rooms, but only the stuff in the main room was like, you know, adversely affected, I think. Uh, I caught a 12 or 14 foot male sunfire that uh, he was on the top cage because he was a little big to be in the top cage, but the snake was really tame and had a great, you know, personality. So I knew that he was safer up there. You know, I, I didn't put anything over my head that was going to try and kill me. So I was smaller snakes, teenage snakes, well-mannered snakes. They were always on the top. Um, and I found him, he had, he had a, like a nose cone of Neodache plastic. His cage was melting and he pushed out of it to escape. So he had this cone of plastic around his nose and we had to wait for that to heal up. He breathed through his mouth because like we didn't want to peel it off because, you know, it's, you know, there's damaged tissue under there. It's at this point, it's protecting it. So we let him heal up and shed it off on his own. It was, it was pretty crazy that he made it out. Not a lot of the top snakes did. Wow. <clears throat> wow. Fucking chip. Jackass. <laughs> <laughs> Love you guys. No. All right. Well, let's uh, let's talk about what you're up to nowadays. Um, what what do you think? I know you're kind of out of the retic world, but what do you, where do you think the retic world is at right now? What's your opinion on that, and what are you up to? I am pretty far removed. Uh, I'm good friends with Chris McVicker, so I I, I hear some retic hoobajoob, and obviously from you, Chip, a lot. You know, James, love you. We don't talk as much. That's okay. Um. So, I mean, I, I, I watched some videos. I saw a great video with Garrett Hartle. I uh, actually just saw him at NARBC not that long ago and was super excited to see him. Got to meet Aubrey Pruitt finally. Um, a few other retic guys there. Um, Jake, again, we've met many times. But uh, I, I think 
I think the trend is something I called a long time ago, which was getting everything into Dwarf. And I know there's plenty of people that love Retix because they're big, Chip, not, not because they're big, but you like the big versions. Uh, you know, you're one of those guys. I know that. That's great. Uh, I think for mainstream retic consumption, they need to be a little smaller. So I think guys like Garrett are doing great steps into getting SD in there or getting, you know, some of the smaller locales worked into various projects and hopefully having more manageable sized animals that somebody doesn't have to plan on, you know, having always having a person in the other room earshot away, you know, if something goes awry, um, I've had it happen. Everybody's had, you've had it happen. Everybody's had it go awry like once or twice. Um, <laughs> yes, like for sure. Um, so like it's a, it's a great step getting things dwarfed down into, let's say under 10 feet. That'd be amazing. Like if, and I know guarantee is a strong word, but like if, if a guy like Garrett can eventually guarantee like, Hey, this pied motley sunfire, whatever, but kind of retic is probably not going to exceed eight to 10 feet long. That's great. Like that's a manageable size animal. And we've probably at that stage would have bred a little more tractability and, and tameness into them instead of being naturally, the way they are like when they're babies and they like some of them just never grow out of it and you know, being defensive, being nippy and, you know, fight first, ask questions later. Also, people don't know how to read their retics. Got to learn to read your retics, people. Like read them like a book. Like if it's, if it's feisty, leave it alone. Like, but if you're picking, if you hold it and it bites you, as long as it's not like super big, you know, you can't put it down right away. It's learning. It's, it's training you as much as you're training it. You know, uh, you're the thumbs, you're in charge, but the, the re six not stupid either. No. So what are you up to? Oh, at Mike's now? Yeah, uh, what, what, what are you doing now with your reptile career? Now with my reptile career, I'm once again back at now. He's rebranded to, uh, it's like third time. Fourth. With the pawn shop, it's four. <laughs> we don't count that. It was a separate, uh, separate. You still uh, worked in the snake shop a little bit when you're at the pawn shop. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so uh, I am, I am in charge of the breeding plan for all the all the wall pythons. Uh, moving males, I get I get a lot of help moving males. It's it's instrumental sometimes to have help because like it takes. On a, on a really good day, it would take me four hours, five hours to move all the male ball pythons to where they need to go in their next route. Um, so moving males, uh, breeding plan, you know, kind of staying aware of like what the latest, greatest stuff is. You know, I, I keep a close eye on like, you know, cool combos that Kadulka is making, Ozzy's making. Uh, mutations creations, all those guys like making great stuff, amazing His stuff. His name is Billy. Billy. Well, he hasn't accepted my friend's request yet, so he's mutation and creation until otherwise noted. Um, so, uh, staying aware of like what the new hotness is, or like one of the more important things is trying to figure out what the next step is. And Mike and I both joke about it that. I'm the three years from now guy and he's the right now guy. So I have to meet him in the middle a lot of like what we're keeping, what we can sell, what we can, what we can manage. Like, how is this, you know, facet of the collection going to play out? How's lavender doing? How is clown doing? How is, you know, it's, it's all, it's all different. And uh, we're just trying to, we're, we're doing two things and, and he has the volume of animals to be able to do two things. And the first thing, the main thing we're doing is the pet level entry ish level with ball pythons. You know, we make a lot of pies, we make a lot of bells, we make a lot of super fires. That's no secret. Everybody knows that. 
Um, and that's, that's stuff that is bread and butter stuff all day long. They're great. People love them. Um, and so we gear a lot of stuff to that. And, you know, that also, you know, goes with albinos, all, all the popular morphs that are, um, Pet store morphs. basically, yeah, you know, but the other thing is we're also doing a lot of the specialty, you know, high end combos with, you know, clown, lavender, GHI, um, you know, all, all we're trying and, you know, all the allelics with, uh, you know, asphalt and gravel and all, all those things is, <clears throat> it's trying to stay relevant with all that stuff and trying to move on to like, uh, another combo or, okay, we see how this is reacting with this. Like, what if we put it with this, um, you or know, trying quadruple recessive like Kobilka. Yeah. I don't know about that. Um, <laughs> that's, I mean, that's great. Like if he ever hits one, that's going to be awesome. But he has, you no, need to watch more Kobilka. The, vi the visual, like he made the heads. I thought he hit the visual. I think he was making heads. You know, I'm not like, I haven't anyway. seen every video, but you know, yeah. Um, so we're, we're doing the two things and it, it, it keeps us busy. Uh, I ID all the babies and sex them and set them up in their first enclosures and um, decide what animals we need to keep or something, you know, we'll, we have people ask about uh, one combo. Okay. So if enough people ask about a certain combo, like I jot it down and I remember like, Hey, you know, cinnamon champagnes, like people really want to see some more cinnamon champagnes. So we will gear something to make a few more cinnamon champagnes or right. what it is. Uh, so trying to stay in tune with like what did really well last year. What can we do a little better this year for that thing? Uh, whatever. So, yeah, I mean, that's what I do. And then on the side of that is, are you shaking it on purpose? What are you doing? Now? I had to plug back in. I was dying. Oh, well, well. So, <laughs> um, also geckos, so crested geckos and New Caledonian big-eyed geckos, goofiest normal name ever. So, Rachidaculus, I know they're not Rachidaculus anymore, but I like the name. Whatever. That's what I'm calling it. Um, well, here's a funny question about your work, and not many people will understand this, but I think I get a chuckle every time. I haven't talked to you in a while, so I don't know if it's changed, but is your former apprentice still your boss? Uh, yes, that is correct. <laughs> God, that cracks me up. It, it is what it is. I, I, don't really, I don't really care too much about it anymore. We, we have... We have a good working relationship now. It was, a, it was a little touch and go in the beginning. Um, you know, he, he's good at the things he does, and I'm good at the things I do. And honestly, um, when I was basically running Constrictors Unlimited, when Mike had moved to Colorado, you know, obviously he had any input he wanted to have, you know, whenever he wanted it. But, you know, I, I did not take that job to have that job. I, I wanted to be doing the thing I'm actually doing now. And when I was there that time, Cody was like the customer service general manager. And I was the manager of animal care, which was, you know, staying on top of animal care of like, where the guys were working on what and, you know, breeding plan, babies, setting up babies, you know, all the stuff previously mentioned I'm actually doing now. I was not hired at the time to do like the whole thing. So, you know, I, I was actually thinking about this today. I, I, I felt like it would come up. So I was, I was going through some of this stuff in my head. Um, you know, I was not mentally ready at the time to take all that on and, you know, had, you know, Mike, you know, his uh, relationship at the time was failing and, you know, that puts stress on everyone. I had a relationship that had failed at the same time as well that, you know, you were around for that. So that, yeah, that was terrible. bad. Um, so it was all, it was a lot of bad timing and, you know, I obviously could have done some things differently. 
uh, everybody can always do things differently. Hindsight's twenty twenty. You know, the grass isn't always greener on the other side. Any other cliche thing you can think of, like this is where it applies. So, you know, it is what it is. And, you know, I'm, I'm actually quite happy doing what I'm doing now because this is the part I enjoy. I, I do, I, I like ball pythons, but like only so much. And that's going to be really weird for people to hear because I'm so involved with them now at work. But I love dabbling in genetics and seeing why a thing behaves a certain way with black pastel instead of Mojave, or why does it react this way? If we have this thing reacting with this and add it to this, what can we do? You know, it's like trying, trying to piece together the next thing before it exists. So wacky. All right. Well, uh, it's all this cool. Huh? That's what makes every all this stuff cool. Oh, you know? absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I used to say, like, learn something new every day. And I, I, I don't know if it's every day now, but it's often. Like, I see a different thing or a, a variation of a thing. Like, well, I didn't think of that. So, whatever. We'll, we'll do that differently next time. Or we'll, we'll make ten more of those. Because <laughs> that one is gone. Got sold. Whatever. Yeah. So, All right, James, yeah. your turn, and you'll finish it up. Well, I, honestly, I don't have a whole lot of questions. I mean, everything is pretty much talked about. Um, you know, you talked about all the stuff that I was hoping that you would talk about, and uh, you want, to, especially when it comes to retics. You know, there's a lot of people need to realize that there's a lot of retic history uh, in Jeff. Uh, he is seen seen it all he has done a lot um you know man <laughs> it's, uh, so i mean it's just it's just really cool to be able to have you on again i think this one is is a lot better than the the first one we did because you know you uh, guys were just like so starstruck and in awe the whole time like we couldn't have like a legit conversation but yeah you were better than kevin <laughs> oh, yeah. i'll take it um, Sorry, evil morph god. You know, so I mean, you know, it's it's definitely. I know we're friends and everything. We've known each other for a long time, but it's definitely an honor to have you on here. And uh, James is another guy that didn't like me when he first met me. He wanted to fight me. Yeah, you didn't like me and wanted to fight me. Also correct. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I girl, why were you talking to her? <laughs> and it's funny because you know that's that's a hundred percent true, and you know I honestly think the world of you. You know, um, love you guys too. So, but you know, but it's it's. I think this this is awesome because you know, hopefully there's you know there's a lot a lot of newer people, um, and I the the whole point of having this is not not a it's not about drama and stuff like that, but stuff like this here, you know, is hearing history and and because there's a lot of history and 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 what we do, and a lot of people don't realize where certain things come from and a lot of stuff is just forgotten. You and remember this, James, when we were trying to get the first golden child, when uh, Bob wasn't allowed in that project at the time. Uh huh. <laughs> Biggie. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of stuff that I don't know. It's funny. Cause you know, there's, you know, speaking of that right there, there's, there's, there's stuff that I, I don't know if I, I want. I don't want to talk about it on you know publicly. <laughs> I think I've said exactly as much as I want to say about it, <laughs> and so, still be friends with everybody involved. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that's about it. I think we. There's always more stuff that we can uh, talk about some other time. Um, I'm sure this won't be the the last time you come on. Um, even if it's just we have somebody else and we bring you on here as like a. A guest host or some shit like that is I'm always down. fun. Just give me, you know, just like you know, this time, you know, give me a day or two heads up, and I'll be available. And I, um, whenever we can get our schedules aligned with the dude that lives in a whole another time zone here, and yeah. you work all the time, so this is really like a magical event. It's like sort of like the three rings of Uranus lining up, probably. <laughs> yeah, pretty much, pretty much, but. 
I want to just once again appreciate you coming on. A uh, couple things, everybody watching, uh, everybody that's going to watch, thanks for supporting the show. Uh, hit the like button, please. Uh, hit the bell um, so you'll be notified. Please subscribe, share, leave a comment. Um, tell us what you think, what you like, what you don't like, what you want to, people you like to see on the show, um, this and that, blah, blah, blah. Um, and last but not least, please, please, you need to donate, support U.S. Arc, please. Uh, U.S. Arc. Yes, if you're at a show, if you're at a show, you see a table. If you don't have a lot of money, donate a dollar. Give them, give them your change. Buy a bumper sticker, anything. Um, Phil is an incredible guy. We couldn't have a better guy running US Arc. He does a tremendous amount of work for every facet of our reptile hobby. It's not just big snakes. It's not just hots. It's not just monitors and tegus. It's everything. It is all important. Every species will matter. So if yes. you think it won't affect you, it will affect you. Yeah. Eventually. We, we, we seen... come to leopard geckos next, but someday. Yeah. I mean, we've seen what's happening or what has happened in Florida. Um, I think most people know what's going on in North Carolina right now, which is bad, very bad. Yeah. Um, donate, please. I don't care what you, I don't care what what kind of reptile, amphibian, whatever it is you keep or whatever you like. Fox uh, people unite. We all have to exactly. But anyhow, you got anything, Chip? No, I, I think we've covered it. All right, man. Uh, once again, thank you, Jeff. Thanks, Chip. Love you guys. Um, it was fun. Let's do it again. All right. Thank you all. Have a good night. Bye, See everybody.